This is Duke University. Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. So wonderful to have all of you here tonight with us at the 15th uh, Duke Gen Startup Showcase, our sixth one here in New York City. Uh, this is going to be a great event. My name is Howie Ree. I work at Duke University, so I flew up from Durham uh, a couple days ago. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here at Yext. And I want to thank, start by thanking Howie Lerman, who is a Duke alum, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Yext, who has made this space available to us. Let's give uh, Howie and the Yext team a round of applause for making this possible. I have a few slides I'm going to go through, but before I do, I want the uh, Duke Gen New York City co-chairs to have a chance to introduce themselves. So Sarah, if you don't mind. Hi, I'm Sarah. I graduated from Trinity in 2013 and currently work for Amazon. Hi, I'm uh, Devin Bostock. Uh, graduated in 2011 and then with Fuqua in 2012. Um, I lead uh, Comerica Bank's uh, venture capital practice here in New York City. Hi, Darian Covellens. I uh, run the Corp Dev team at Audible, which is an Amazon subsidiary. Wonderful. And uh, Molly Himmelstein is our fourth, fourth co-chair in New York City. She will be here, but is uh, running a little bit behind this evening. So uh, it's because of these people that uh, we have great events in New York City. And I'd love to give them a round of applause for all the work that they've done for this event and for many other events here. Y'all, you can sit down. Now. Yeah, thank you. OK, so just to jump into this event. Uh, so Duke Gen, the Duke Global Entrepreneurship Network, is kind of what we're all here and a part of. Let me just see by show of hands, for how many of you is this your first Duke Gen event? This is the first time you've been to a Duke Gen event. Okay, great. So for about half of you, you don't know what Duke Gen is about. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it in a few slides here. So in 2008, we asked the question, how do you connect Dukies that are interested in, on, in startups, in entrepreneurship? Uh, at the time, we had a couple of Duke alumni who came to us and just said, listen, I've been an entrepreneur in the Bay Area for 20 years, I don't have any Duke folks that I know of or any Duke students reaching out to me, can you help me get plugged in? And so that is the goal of Duke Gen, the Duke Global Entrepreneurship Network. And our tagline is productive connections. And my hope is that for those of you that are here tonight, you're gonna go ahead and meet a couple people that will be interesting to you and uh, be able to help one another out. That's a big part of our, our mission and, and these events. So what we did back in 2008 is we started with a LinkedIn group. We said, hey, let's just see if we can get other Duke alumni interested in entrepreneurship to get together. So since then, we've gone from zero people to 7,000 people. This actually slide is slightly outdated from, from a few months ago. Uh, and we're the third largest Duke University group just behind the, the Alumni Association and the, the Fuqua School of Business. And we're the largest university-based entrepreneurship group on LinkedIn. So uh, I think we've hit a nerve with uh, the Duke community. And what does that mean? So it means that Duke alums like Chandra Levy, who is a Duke alum uh, that was based in Boston, uh, can post a question and just ask people uh, from the Duke hive mind, you know, what kind of uh, domain name should I get for my startup? And what you can see here kind of from the blue arrow on the left is that 24 Duke people commented with kind of suggestions and ideas. So it's just kind of a nice way to tap into advice from the network. The other thing we have is uh, since a couple years ago, we have a pretty active Duke Gen Facebook group with about 3,000 members. And we post uh, news, funding, jobs, uh, all sorts of startup things there all the time. So I encourage you all to join us there. So after we started doing these online things, we said, okay, what can we do in person? So in 2009, we said, let's start hosting in-person events in cities around the country and see if Duke volunteers might step up and say, you know, let's host an entrepreneurship event in our city. So this is, these are actually photos from the first networking event that we held in 2009. Again, just volunteer driven, no budget in Durham, Atlanta and Washington DC and a few other cities on the same night. And since that event, we've had about 300 events with 15,000 Duke alums RSVP'd in cities all across the country and even around the world. And so um, this event is actually uh, a part of this week's events. We have several other events going on around the country. Uh, most of them are going to be happening on Wednesday night. So what are some other things that Duke Gen provides? 
we have so many entrepreneurs that ask, you know, hey, who are the Duke investors out there? And we have over 200 Duke investors that are in the community. And so we uh, put all their information online. Uh, we started profiling interesting Duke alums just to get a sense of, you know, their stories and to share those with people like, uh, like you who are, are thinking about entrepreneurship. And so companies like Melissa and Doug, Mint.com and Zico were all founded by Duke people. And we share those stories online and actually have interviews with all of them. So the event that you're at tonight, the Startup Showcase, was an event that a Duke alum named Jim Scheinman, who uh, is an uh, active investor, suggested to us in 2010. He said, hey, all this stuff is great. What I would really like to see are Duke startups pitching to Duke investors in front of a Duke-friendly audience. Like, there's all these demo days going around, but you only see maybe a couple Duke people there. Let's just do one for the Duke audience here. So in 2010, May 2010, we did our first version of this event which was in San Francisco at a space called Dog Patch Labs. These are eight Duke student, uh, not student, eight Duke alumni uh, startups pitching to four Duke angel investors uh, from left to right. Ryan Spoon, uh, who is with Dog Patch Labs, Polaris Ventures, now runs all digital at ESPN. Uh, next to him in the blue and white uh, plaid shirt is Josh Felzer. Josh is a double Dukey. He sold one company for 300 million, another for 60 million. Uh, he runs a uh, $30 million fund called Freestyle Ventures, uh, Freestyle Capital. Aaron Patzer in the red shirt. Aaron um, graduated from Duke and started Mint.com. Mint was acquired by Intuit for $170 million. And Jim Scheinman, Jim, who came up with this idea, uh, his claim to fame is he's invested in four companies that have gone on to be worth a billion dollars or more. His most recent company that was worth a billion dollars was a company called Cruise. Cruise was acquired recently by General Motors for a billion dollars. It provides self-driving technology. And this was the audience uh, at the time, about 70 folks uh, from Duke. It was such a great event that we said, hey, let's do this in New York City. So that fall in New York City, we again brought Duke startups to pitch to angel investors in front of a Duke-friendly audience. So since then, um, we've had a number of teams that have come through here. Just to highlight a few that have actually gone on to uh, raise money and, and continue our <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Daily Muse is a New York City company founded by Catherine Minshew. She pitched uh, in 2011 at our New York City event. She's gone on to raise uh, more than $1.2 million uh, and has done really well. Uh, it's a career advice site. Win-Win uh, was a company that pitched at our most recent event in San Francisco this past June. On the spot, um, one of the people in the audience, not even one of our investors, he just said, hey, I want to invest $100,000. Can you give me a call this weekend and we can talk about it? Uh, so Mike uh, got that money. He was a former standout football player um, at the beginning of the Cutcliffe era. And there's a bunch of other interesting companies here that have gone on to raise money. And so this, this, the teams that you see today, uh, it can actually uh, help give a little boost to them. So um, with that, I'm just going to wrap up a little bit about what Duke Gen is. I'm going to invite uh, Ryan Fru, who is my Duke colleague. Ryan, where are you sitting there? I'm gonna invite him in just a, a, a couple slides here to talk about the Duke Angel Network. Many of you don't know what that is. The Duke Angel Network is uh, relatively new and Ryan's gonna give you some of the details there. He is my colleague and is an alum who helps run the Duke Angel Network. And I'm also gonna invite Matt Tolnick up to talk about Lawless Jerky. Matt, I don't know where you are. Uh, I'm gonna invite you up. He's our uh, official uh, food sponsor for the night, and you have packets of lawless jerky all around. He'll be up in a few minutes as well. So there are many ways to get involved with Duke Gen. I'm not going to go over all these things here, but really my hope for you tonight is that you network with folks, you meet a couple other people. Uh, we're going to have a, a post-event uh, networking event at a bar. I'm going to buy drinks for a few people. Uh, would love to have you join us, and so I really do hope you uh, meet other people. So. Uh, one other thing before I go to Ryan here. So we have um, something called Startup Connect. So for those of you that work at startups, for those of you that are starting companies, for those of you that invest in startups, if you are looking for student interns, please email me. We are constantly sending out um, internship opportunities to Duke students, and it's really led to some really great connections. Um, so if you're, looking, <clears throat> if you're looking for interns and you're not sure how to navigate the Career Center, please feel free to reach out to me and uh, we'll get you connected. So with that, Ryan, if you don't mind coming up and sharing a little bit about the Duke Angel Network, be great.
Hi, I'm Ryan Fru, as Howie mentioned. Uh, I help to run the Duke Angel Network. Um, so we are a group of uh, Duke affiliated Duke affiliated angel investors, uh, so primarily alums with a couple of faculty members as well. Um, and we invest exclusively in companies uh, that have a Duke founder or non founder executive. Uh, so we have about 85 members uh, scattered across the country. Our, our biggest group is actually here in New York. Uh, also, have a cluster down in the Triangle, uh, in the Bay Area, and elsewhere, um, and investing in companies all over the country as well. Uh, so we've done 13 investments so far. Uh, in a pretty broad range of industries from medical devices to uh, hardware and software companies to consumer to packaged goods. Uh, so C stage companies, uh, average check sizes, right around $300,000. So uh, we're actively looking for companies to invest in as well as looking to grow the membership base. Uh, so if you're interested, you can look us up online. We have a portal for companies to submit their information as well as for new members to join. Uh, or find me, I'll, I'll be here tonight. Uh, so I look forward to getting to know a lot of you. Thanks a lot. Great, wonderful. So um, uh, Matt, can we invite you up now to, to say hello and, and talk about your company, Lawless Jerky, and then we're gonna invite the panelists um, in order here to come say hello. Matt, what year did you graduate from Duke Law? Yeah. Duke, from Duke, Duke Law. Yeah. I didn't Duke graduate. Duke. Uh, 2005. How long do you want me to talk? Sure. <clears throat> um, well, so I don't, I don't know about me as an official sponsor, but Lawless Jerky did donate some bags in the back. Um, we're a company that started, um, the story started on Few Quad when I got my first dehydrator at the uh, Walmart at 15501 between Durham and uh, Chapel Hill. And uh, I'd say about half of the people who were there that day are now part of our company. We have three Duke employees of our six employees, uh, 10 Duke investors. And um, I guess like the, the moral of the story for me is when I graduated Duke, I wasn't sure if it was a good investment. Um, I could have gone to Rutgers for free and they would have paid me. Um, but like, you know, then, then I went to law school and I hated it and I became lawless. And um, it, it, in, in, in trying to get this company going, um, my friends through their help on our original Kickstarter campaigns and then friends and friends of friends who became investors, um, the Duke community was really great. Um, but while I was at Duke, entrepreneurship was not really encouraged or part of any curriculum outside of social entrepreneurship. Uh, I did a class with Tony Brown as part of the PPS major. Um, and now, you know, there's a certificate, um, and as an entrepreneur who's relied on Duke people to kind of help grow the business, um, I want to do anything I can to give back. So, you know, Howie will contact me from time to time asking if I'll mentor students who are interested um, in, in food related things. And I always do it as much as I can. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a class that I'm working with. It's the second set of students who are coming through. There's individuals who come through. Uh, and then I also will will go to Howie and see if there's anyone kind of upstream who he can connect me with. Um, so it's it's a great network. I encourage everyone to get involved in all the ways that were listed previously. Um, Howie is an amazing resource for Duke. I think it's um, it's very important for all of us to communicate to whoever we can to make sure Howie doesn't leave because it's like <laughs> it's like uh, you know in in the in like the 1700s if a if like a library went up in flames, you don't have anything anymore. And I feel like he is, he's our encyclopedia of like connecting all these people. So um, this, is, this is all great what you're doing. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. So one of the reasons why I'm, I'm here now is, is for this event. So um, there, there's, it's great that there's others around the country too. But um, th thank you all for being here in all your capacities. It's all valuable. And um, yeah, I'm just very, very pleased to be able to talk to you guys a little bit. Thank you. Can we hand out your back? Can we? Right in the back. Yeah, I encourage people to grab uh, bags um, at any point during the event. Yes. Okay, great. So uh, we're on to the main portion of the event here. So I'm going to invite uh, Steve to come up first and introduce himself. And then Amanda, you're next after that. Uh, and before we begin, some errata, and I take full responsibility for this. So we have two mystery judges who are with us tonight. Uh, Mangesh Hedekudur, who is the co-founder of Mental Floss, the 
the best media company in the world. Can I say that? Am I allowed to say that? And uh, Andrew Brown, who uh, started a company called Oyster, which was acquired by Google a year ago, the best book company in the world. Is that fair? Okay, good. So uh, I apologize that their names are not in here, but they are uh, both Duke alums who will be judging tonight. So with that, Steve, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Sure. Thanks, Howie. Hear me? Okay. Got it. So thanks for having us. It was a great event. And, uh, you know, I think um, entre entrepreneurship is a lot about uh, serendipity. And that's what I love about these types of, of groups is that you never know who you're going to meet, what you're going to see, and what you're going to hear. And uh, my Duke experience was definitely serendipitous. Um, one of uh, my classmates was a guy named uh, J.B. Pritzker, who um, turns out uh, um, uh, was part of the Pritzker family and uh, his family owned a bunch of Hyatt hotels at one point. And uh, after I graduated from law and business school, um, he ended up investing in my company, which is based here in New York. It was called Ad One Classified Network. We, put, uh, we helped newspapers put their classified ads online, which in 1995 and 1996 um, uh, was a radical idea. We sold it a couple of years later. I started a venture fund called Silicon Alley Venture Partners. Um, we backed two, two companies here called, uh, one was called Live Person, the other is called Metadata, the two, two of the bigger technology companies here in New York. Um, and, uh, and then um, now I'm actually working again for, for JB. Uh, I advise his family office, Pritzker Group, on early stage investing um, in the New York and East, East Coast. Um, we deploy about 100 million a year in venture. Um, seed A and B companies, so we're on the lookout for smart people um, who are doing interesting things. And uh, um, I also run a firm called uh, Alpha Venture Partners, which um, actually is a little bit of a twist. So for the back half of my career, I was thinking about all the opportunity that my that I had as an early stage VC to deploy a lot more money later stage. And so we formed kind of this alpha network of VCs, it's 100 VCs who manage you know, 10, 20, $50 million. And you think that these guys are making it big time. But the reality is, is half of them don't. <laughs> and of the other half, it's only maybe 20% of those guys that have a couple home runs like I did. Um, and even then it's a modest, it's actually pretty modest what a small VC does. But if you can invest 20 or 30 or 50 million and just the one out of 20 deals that works out really well, that can be pretty lucrative. So um, started Alpha Venture Partners about four years ago. And again, JB was an investor. Um, so very helpful to have gone to Duke. Duke. Uh, but in addition, um, you know, the experiences I had so uh, was, was uh, impactful. Um, not to get into it here, but um, hopefully you guys get something out of tonight. Um, last time I was here, I saw Howie, I said, hey, listen, I'm hiring a, an associate, who do you know? And, and Ben Freeberg, who's in the back, he's a uh, uh, recent uh, Duke grad, we hired him, and we're hiring another uh, associate slash analyst. So anyone who's interested, let me know. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Hi, I'm Amanda Freeman. I'm class of 98. Uh, and I'm both an entrepreneur and an investor. And my investing actually did start at Duke. I don't know who's old enough to remember Little Dino's, the sub shop. So I invested in a delivery company that was like pyramid scheme marketing. It was, I don't know, it, was, it wasn't legit, I don't think. And I invested in the hideaway. Who's old enough to know the hideaway? Okay, so yes. So my investing day started at Duke, but... After that, uh, I've been a multi-time entrepreneur. I had a business called Vital Juice, which isn't a juice company. It probably would have been better if it was, but it was a health and wellness daily email. If you know Well and Good now, it was very similar to what Well and Good, it was similar to what Well and Good is. I currently run a business I started called SLT. It's, uh, we own, I own 12 fitness studios in the New York and surrounding areas. We're opening in Philly. Uh, I raised private equity money from a fund called North Castle Partners recently. 
Um, and I invest in some startups, mostly female founded businesses. So thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, Howie, for the invite. Uh, my name is Adam Bezvenik. Uh, I graduated from Duke in 2009. Uh, while I was on campus, I ran the Duke Entrepreneur, which was the entrepreneurship club on campus, and then helped bring the Cairo Society, which is an international student entrepreneurship group to campus. Um, and then uh, also was part of the initial group that opened Duke, Hat Duke University Hatchery on campus, which was a co-working space to get students out of their dorm rooms, out of apartments, and actually um, building companies alongside each other, um, bringing in local VCs and angels and, and uh, faculty members. Uh, and since Duke, um, have sort of been in the tech entrepreneurship scene now for the last several years um, after a brief stint um, in finance and realized they needed to do something more meaningful. Um, and so started working with uh, Chris Saka at Lowercase Capital while I was in business school, worked remotely for Chris for a couple of years moved to San Francisco and joined a company called Wanilo as the first business hire after they raised their A. Um, and then for the last two and a half years have been um, sort of leading all East Coast investing for one called Deep Fork Capital, which is a micro VC, $30 million fund, um, investing in anything software driven, primarily uh, a mix of marketplaces, SaaS and AI and machine learning applications, um, pretty evenly split between the Bay Area and New York. Thanks. Thank you. Howie, thanks for having me. Uh, Darian Covellins um, was a Fuqua grad in 2012. Before Fuqua, I was a venture capital lawyer in Philadelphia and New York. So as you might imagine, I was very popular in business school for free legal advice. Um, but after I graduated there, uh, I went and worked for two venture funds. Um, I had the distinction of uh, having one of them go under while I was there, uh, so that wasn't fun, but it actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I ended up at Audible, um, which for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a subsidiary of Amazon, um, but a very independent subsidiary. Uh, we are run entirely separately. Our founder and CEO uh, is still our CEO, and I run a group there called the New Ventures Group, which is simultaneously a innovations team and the corporate development team. Um, we have four people on the team right now, and we always hire uh, at least one intern. So anybody who is in the New York area from Duke or from Fuqua or any other uh, graduate school will be happy to hire you. Hey, guys. Um, Jonathan Drillings. Uh, I was proud of four. Um, Thanks, Howie, for, for having me. Thanks, CX, for setting this up. Um, I guess my Duke uh, startup entrepreneurship story uh, was I ran university shipping uh, while I was in school. I don't know, New York, New Jersey, Northeasterners might, might remember it. Um, after I graduated, I, I went on to the finance dark side for a few years myself. Um, and then basically since about 06, I've been you know, in the kind of startup and, and venture world. I was at a growth stage fund out in San Francisco for a few years, moved back here and was on the startup side for a few years. Uh, actually worked here at Yext um, for, for I don't know, about six months or so, uh, but I uh, was with another startup for about two and a half years uh, and then moved back onto the venture side. And uh, about six months ago, I moved over to a firm called Riverside Company to help start their venture effort. It's a large multi-strategy um, private equity shop, but we're a $50 million fund focused on enterprise uh, and broadly B2B software applications, um, kind of the early growth phase, a million and a half upwards uh, of revenue. And our whole model is that once you reach that milestone, um, it can be really hard to raise incremental capital for growth. So, you know, if you're really kind of knocking the, the cover off the ball, you go out and you raise a big growth round and, and you continue to fuel that growth. But for points in your life cycle where you need, you know, a million or two million to, you know, build out product extensions, test new sales channels, things like that, it can be really hard to raise that capital once you reach kind of a million, million and a half um, of revenue. Uh, and so we help kind of plug that gap for companies and then continue to invest behind them as they go out and continue to raise growth capital. Thanks. Thanks for the praise, Howie, earlier. Um, my name is Mangesh Atikler. I started Mental Floss. Um, Mental Floss is actually the second media company I started. Uh, the first one was called um, Dogs of My Neighborhood. And I started in third grade. 
Uh, like many media companies, it folded very quickly. Uh, our, our second ones lasted a little longer. Um, the idea behind Mental Floss is uh, it treats uh, all culture like pop culture. And the whole idea is, is to make uh, learning addictive. Um, we reach about 25 million unique uh, users a month. We, um, you know, the, this year we just started a video division and um, have done about 200 million video views. Uh, we've done all sorts of cool things along the way from uh, a book series to, to um, last year we did a show with Nat Geo that aired in 45 different languages called Brain Surgery Live, where we actually broadcast a, a brain surgery uh, across the world. Um, and uh, the one thing I'd say about Duke that, that, that's one of my favorite memories was when we launched the magazine, we, um, we didn't have much money. We, we decided to throw a wine and cheese party in the Bryant Center, but uh, we didn't really have money for cheese, so we had Cheetos on toothpicks. And then Bryant Center wouldn't let us have wine, so it, we had grape soda. So I think launch parties are overrated, but uh, <laughs> I'm uh, super excited to be here. Hi folks, uh, my name is Andrew Brown. I'm uh, Duke 2011 and Howie, thanks for uh, inviting me tonight. Um, I guess you can say one of my really early uh, entrepreneurial experiences was actually pitching at this event. I think it was the first one in New York uh, five years ago, second one in New York five years ago. It's actually my first time back since then, which is a shame on me, but uh, it's great to be back and excited to, uh, to hear the pitches tonight. Um, I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO of a company called Oyster. Uh, we are a uh, Netflix-like subscription service for eBooks. Uh, so basically pay 10 bucks a month and get access to uh, over a million books uh, in, our, uh, in our catalog. Uh, we sold that business to Google uh, about a year ago and so basically are in the process of integrating all of our technology and product uh, into Google Playbooks. Uh, now that I'm part of Google, I'm doing some early stage uh, angel investing as well as working with a couple of seed firms uh, here in New York. So excited to be here tonight. All right, wonderful. If you all don't mind having a seat over here. And then uh, Jeff with Debitize, if you don't mind coming up. By the way, while they're getting settled, the after party is going to be at, Sarah, thank you, is at a bar called uh, Live Bait. I guess that's the name of the bar. It's, it's right around the corner. It's uh, 14 East 23rd Street. So uh, please join us at Live Bait immediately after the event. Okay. Cool, all right. So uh, each pitch is gonna be about four minutes time, though a timer will go off at four minutes. And then we're gonna get one question from the audience. You all are gonna have a chance to vote for your favorite at the end, uh, and the judges are going to deliberate. So uh, let's give a big round of applause to Jeff with Debitize. Thank you, thank you. All right, so how many of you have a credit card? Most of you, right? And do you love managing it? Um, that might be a small inconvenience for most of you, but for millions of Americans, it's actually a source of personal stress. I mean, some of you may know the numbers. Four in 10 Americans have credit card debt to the tune of $115 billion a year in interest and late fees paid. That's a tremendous number. And it's one of the leading causes of personal bankruptcy. So what do people do? Well. A lot of times they end up cutting up their credit cards and using cash or debit because it's just easier to use that you know where your money's going. But then the problem is you're leaving rewards on the table or you're not building credit, which is important because if, if you've ever tried to buy a house without a credit score, you can't. Or apparently getting like an apartment here in New York City. Um, so anyways, you get a credit card because that's what people say you should do. And you put yourself on a budget, you try to manage it effectively. Uh, but most of us are not in love with personal finance. And after a certain amount of time, you, you know, forget that you bought something really expensive or you miss a payment or something like that. Even if there are, even if nothing bad or nothing wrong happens, it's still stressful to have to check your account balances all the time and, you know, do the mental math of like, do I really have enough money in my checking account? That's why we started Debitize. What we do is take that credit card and directly connect it to your checking account. Every day when you make your $5 purchase for a latte at Starbucks, that money comes out of your checking account as soon as possible. We save it for you, and then we pay your credit card bill automatically at the end of each month. 
it's important to note that this automation is intelligent. So if you have a fully funded account, um, what we'll do is optimize the payments on your credit card in a way that'll lower your utilization. That's really technical, but the effect is your credit score will improve. Uh, so many of you have probably used things like Mint.com or Credit Karma, and these apps are really good at giving you information about your, you know, your accounts, your credit uh, you know, score and everything, but they don't actually help you do anything about uh, improving your personal finance situation. And we at Debitize believe that good personal finance is only, it, part of it is knowing what the right thing to do is, but the second part is actually doing that right thing consistently and over time. That's why we believe in automation. So we launched about six months ago, and since then we've grown to over 2,000 users, and we've paid off over $1.5 million of credit card purchases for the users on our platform. Um, we have users who have seen their credit score improve over 30 points uh, since using Debitize, so we know it's working. Uh, there are a couple of ways that we can monetize, including affiliate marketing, which is something that Mint and Credit Karma have been very successful in doing. Uh, that's probably gonna be the first one we'll turn on. We can also invest the money sitting in our users' accounts and eventually charge for premium features. Once we reach scale, we can do things like remarket some of the analytics that we have or white label our product for financial institutions. There are tons of things that we can do. Uh, the team right now is three of us, me, my co-founder, okay. Me, my co-founder who's sitting in the audience. Um, I graduated from Duke in 09 with a degree in biomedical engineering and I've also got an MBA from Yale. Uh, my co-founder had worked in uh, structured derivatives at JP Morgan for almost a decade and he went to UC Berkeley for undergrad. And we've also got a lead engineer who has a master's in computer engineering from UCF. So I just wanna wrap up and say that the credit card experience is flawed. And we believe that it shouldn't be as hard to manage a credit card as it is for a lot of Americans. And so at Debitize, we're all about being the one-stop shop to make sure that the credit card experience is better for all Americans. Thank you. stay up here fantastic so one question from the judges who wants to ask a question <laughs> could you just like briefly explain a little bit more sort of what the onboarding experience is like um, and sort of how simple it is because I my take on a lot of sort of personal finance that there's a little too much friction up front in terms of sinking lots of accounts so can you sort of explain how you've been able to kind of get over that Sure, so we've actually invested a lot of research in our user experience because we do recognize that, I mean, there are, there are you know, things that you have to enter, like your banking credentials, you have to give us, uh, because we're moving money, you have to give us information about you know, your date of birth and et cetera. But every step along the way, we're letting the user know what they're getting out of this stuff that they're putting in. So for example, the first thing that they do is actually put nothing in except for their name and email. And then we say, you know, if you connect a credit card, you'll see your balances and you'll see what your utilization is. So they put in their credit card information and then immediate and so on and so on. Um, so the, the, I think the idea is every step along the way, we're rewarding the user. Great. Let's give Jeff a hand. <laughs> Next up is Hello Raw. Hi, I'm Becky Holmes. I'm the founder and CEO of Elo Raw. So 95% of all chronic disease is caused by food choice, toxic ingredients, and nutritional deficiencies. Yet our entire food industry is centered around chemical-filled, nutrient-void, food-like substances that keep us going, but at what cost? So I grew up in a family that dealt with a lot of health issues, physical to mental, from obesity to depression, and I realized that what we put in our bodies truly affects how we live our lives, how we think, how we feel, so I set off to create a product that was truly good for us, yet really delicious. So welcome, Ella Raw. So Ella Raw, we make simple superfood um, dessert bites that are filled with organic ingredients, just six, six or less ingredients, things like dates, nuts. Um, we focus on raw. So what is raw? That, that means that from um, the ground to our product, none of these ingredients have ever been heated above a certain temperature. What this does is it maintains the amount of um, enzymes and natural vitamins that are available in these sources. So this is living nutrition. You see, when we heat things like energy bars or a lot of our processed snacks, we lose up to 70 to 80% of the vitamins and minerals and almost 100% of phytonutrients. And these are those micronutrients that allow our bodies to heal itself, repair itself, and function properly. 
So we really focus on this raw and living nutrition side to being a 100% raw product while focusing on convenience. Something you can grab off the shelf, put in a bag, and go after you pay for it, of course. So um, the global snack industry is a $370 billion industry. People are focused on vegetarian, vegan, organic, plant-based. It's really on the rise. And when people are starting to um, buy food or looking at food choices, you're focused on health and it's becoming a priority. So our strategy is twofold. We're focusing on wholesale as well as direct to consumer online. Um, we've sold over 7,000 bags and we've grown 2,400% in our first year going into retailers. We also were accepted as a vendor for the entire Southeast region of Whole Foods, which was really exciting um, and a great sort of boost. We're finalizing distribution right now and are hoping to start in the triangle and then as we um, scale, expand in the Southeast. We also sent product to Starbucks headquarters, got incredible feedback, and they want to see how we do in Whole Foods. So we're excited that that door is also open. We received a 5,000 unit purchase order from Earthbox, which is one of the largest subscription boxes, really focused on online and um, sort of broadening the market nationally. So social media has been a huge tool for us. We really focus on Instagram um, with a zero marketing budget, and we've had our products shared all across the country. Uh, one of the top influencers on Instagram shared a photo of our product, and in um, four hours, we received four times the amount of sales we would do in a month just from that post. So that was really exciting to see the potential of influencers in this market. We also just got back from Natural Products Expo East, which is one of the largest expos in our industry. Um, we got about 15 new retail orders, incredible feedback, and we walked away being named one of the top seven new exhibitors out of all of the thousands of exhibitors. So that was really exciting um, validation as well. So right now, um, we have the demand and we're trying to build our supply so that we can fund um, purchase orders or ship the purchase orders and get product to the people knocking at our door. So good problem to have, still a problem. Um, we're starting, we're trying to raise $100,000. The first 25K of that will go immediately to increase our, rev, our revenue rate um, capacity, our run rate capacity to $2 million. And then the following 75 will allow us to get to 1 million in 18 months. Um, so I'd love to talk to anyone if this really hits the chord with you. So we are excited for the journey. It's really exciting. Um, Lots of places we can go, and I thank you for being a part of it. Thank you. Yeah, there's a few flavors you guys can pass around. Can I that what the margin on the product is? Yeah. So um, we currently are. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Our um, wholesale price is about $280. Um, our, we sell, our retail price suggests is $499. Um, our cost of goods is about $1.25 right now without uh, economies of scale. So it, our cost of goods right now is about $1.25. So wholesale, we make about 56% um, percent online, about 70% margins. Thank you, Becky. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, is Focusmate. I am Taylor, founder and CEO of Focusmate. <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about procrastination, a problem near and dear to many of us. You may not realize that this problem has grown fivefold since 1978 and now impacts one in four Americans. That's just chronic procrastination. Um, meanwhile, thanks to modern technology and these devices we all carry around, we are less capable than ever of doing difficult and important work. So there is a solution, and all of you have experienced it. When you're in the presence of another person, when you have an accountability partner, we show up and we perform in a way that we just don't for ourselves. So this is the core innovation that we've, ca that, that, that we've captured with Focusmate, which is a virtual one-to-one -one video-based co-working experience. So the way it works is, first, you book a session anytime you want to get productive. We automatically match you with a partner and send you a calendar invitation and a video hangout link. And here's where the rubber hits the road. You show up at the appointed time, you join the hangout link, you share your first task, and each of you separately gets to work, quietly cranking out your most important tasks with a video hangout in the background. <clears throat> so um, this process enables you to get into a productive flow state anytime immediately. So the proof is in our prototype user data, okay? Our top 10% of users 
are booking an average of seven sessions per week. Okay, so Focusmate is like their lifeline to ensure that they get their most important work done every day. Meanwhile, 100% of these core users have expressed a, willing, a willingness to pay, and we've seen extremely strong peer-to-peer -peer referrals. Our target market are people who live and die by their productivity. Okay, so this is freelancers, creatives, solopreneurs, people who work in an unstructured home office environment. This is a huge market and it's growing very rapidly as autonomy and freedom increasingly becomes um, the norm and what we demand in the workplace. But actually, that's just the beginning. So this isn't just for freelancer productivity. This is for writing that book you've always wanted to write or learning to code or play guitar or cooking more healthy meals at home more often, studying for that big exam, even working out at home. So what we're really building is a uh, community and a social network providing human accountability for any task on demand. So how will we get there? Well, as I mentioned, we've already seen extremely strong peer-to-peer -peer referrals. And in the coming year, we'll use content marketing, SEO, and influencer partnerships, which is just mentioned, huge, hugely effective um, to rapidly acquire users and revenue. Um, how do we make money? In December, uh, we're launching our V1 and we'll be monetizing that with a freemium model or a monthly subscription. But to, to really understand the potential of this, just ask yourself, what would it be worth to you if you could guarantee that every day you would get your most important work done? That's the kind of impact and financial value that we believe we can capture. So, um, we are in a fiercely competitive space, productivity and collaboration tools. We have no direct competitors to date, but we believe that our first uh, competitive advantage is our community. This is a group of people who are committed to increasing their personal productivity, and we have a distinctive user experience. There's a high level of trust and a sense of belonging. Which brings me to our next strength. Our team is uniquely knowledgeable and passionate about human potential. So personally, for the last four years, I've served as an executive coach and performance consultant, supporting numerous uh, C-suite executives at eight and nine figure startups, um, as well as grad students at Yale and Wharton. My co-founder and CTO is a, is, a, is a one man study in human potential. At age 15, he left Nepal alone during the Maoist uprising. He moved to South India where he spoke neither of the local languages. And, <coughs> hi, Howie. And <laughs> And two years later, he graduated first in his class and competed in India's National Math Olympiad. Um, <clears throat> You're making me nervous, man. <clears throat> um, we'd like to invite all of you to um, experience productivity on demand. If you sign up this week uh, at this link, you can skip the wait list. That's focusmate.com forward slash DukeGen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, hello. Um, so subscription, converting people from uh, free to subscription uh, accounts is notoriously difficult. Um, how are you gonna test that before you really scale this? Like wh what's your use case for doing that? Yeah, so um, we're gonna try and sync that up with launching our V1. And um, so we'll start in December by just doing some pricing experiments and basically explain to people, you know, here's a package you can buy that guarantees you access to the pro version for ever and locks in that price and, um, and, and then sort of offer a few different pricing tiers and packages to start to get some data. So it is, it's a small, um, you know, private prototype community of users right now, but it's enough that we'll get some statistically significant data and then we can create some pricing um, plans on that basis that as, as we open up to the broader um, community. Thank you, Taylor. Let's give him a big round of applause. Next up is Lucky Diem. Thank you, Howard. Hey, everyone, I'm Andrew from Lucky Diem T89. One of the gray hairs here. Um, I started Lucky Diem uh, about four years ago. What we are is local search reinvented. What we're doing is making it fun for those 90% of consumers that find a new business through search. But more importantly, we are making it incredibly easy for small businesses, local businesses, 
to get online, have an interactive marketing experience. 90% of those businesses don't spend a dime right now. Um, this is a far cry. I mean, I started this company four years ago, 20 years prior to that, I was part of a very small group of three people that incubated something called Sony.com. And back then, um, marketing to consumers online was very taboo. You don't, didn't touch it. Um, today, of course, digital marketing is so omnipresent that our brains have become very, very efficient with uh, filtering every message out. Our goal at Lucky Diem is to make it fun and kind of re uh, flip marketing upside down. Let the message be pulled in rather than pushed at them. And we do that through a number of mechanisms, you know, a combination of uh, behavioral economics uh, mixed in with gaming mechanics. I think that's a very fancy way of just saying we make it marketing fun. Um, Here's an example. We launched the company four years ago just for major brands. That was our focus back then. And this is a client, uh, La Quinta Inns, where you could spin to win and instantly win three nights and loyalty points. But you could increase those loyal, excuse me, loyalty points by engagement. Answer a branded trivia question. Share it with your friends and get rewarded with more loyalty points. And this is when it went viral. Uh, the green represents all of the new members we brought to La Quinta. The blue were the existing members we started with. Um, but a funny thing happened at the end of this campaign where we should have been very excited because we you know, crushed all of our benchmarks. Um, I got really, really frustrated because our phones, emails got inundated with calls from smaller local businesses saying, hey, came across Lucky Diem. How can I run this for my business? Guess what? It didn't scale. We didn't build it that way. So we decided at that point to rebuild Lucky Diem so it could be power any size business. Um, and in order to do that, of course, if you're going to start a marketing platform, you should start with search because obviously that's the path to purchase of almost every consumer out there today. Um, trust your friends, yes. And use mobile couponing, it's built, saving money is built into our DNA, but I kind of started Lucky Diem in the first place as a gut reaction to daily deals. You know, not so good for businesses. Uh, but how do you give consumers that discount without destroying the margins and the loyalty that comes along with a daily deal? And then finally, we all heard the expression, the medium is the message, right? So if everyone's addicted to playing games on their phones, why not make marketing a game on a phone. So most importantly, when we approached the local business owners and said, hey, what is it gonna take to sell you a marketing platform? They all started to say the same three things. Andrew, don't ask me to add any software or hardware to my systems. And most importantly, don't ask me to pay for it. I'm sick of testing it and not having any proof that the money I spend out there is gonna end up in my till right here. Uh, so our platform is pay per sale only. If businesses only pay us when a customer pays us, uh, pays them. And I'll show you how we do that through some, some FinTech. Um, here's how it works. These are actual customers. We launch next week on the Upper East Side. You're, you're supposed to hold Howie back. <laughs> this is how it works. I'm gonna, it's, it's the same thing as the Kinta, but this very cool virtual reality, a uh, virtual card. And we also have integrated a loyalty that platform that is gamified, which is cool. So now we give uh, businesses the opportunity to not only see who are the best customers, but also reward them, uh, not just on the purchase behavior, but since we have a closed system of reward and see everything, what's being shared, we can tell businesses too, who are the most influential customers, not just the ones that are spending most, our business model is really simple. We take 10% of each transaction. It's a humongous market out there. And finally, I just want to kind of echo uh, kind of the, uh, where's Matt? Matt uh, said it best. You know, this guy here is really making a big difference for entrepreneurs everywhere. I've had the honor and privilege of hiring a number of interns, full-time employees over the past two years. And you know, here's some summer interns full-time employees. Uh, we actually have a five-person MEM 
uh, that's the Ma Masters of Engineering uh, uh, degree down at Duke. I had, had to actually go down to Durham last weekend and check them out, check out the UNC game. And of course, uh, I showed up at Shooters to supervise a couple of my uh, interns down there. Anyway, thank you, Howie, and thank you guys. Uh, we, we love Duke. Thank you, Andrew. Stay up, right? Thanks, Question? How do um, how do the local businesses get on the platform? Is it uh, kind of like a Yelp model where they're already on there? And um, do you guys have to integrate into it? You know, for the beta that we're launching in New York City, it was boots on the street, door to door sales. And the reaction we were getting surprised me um, because we have removed all the barriers from entry of no hardware, no software, no cost. The reaction we're getting is kind of shrug. It's like, why wouldn't I do this? So we're actually converting about 60% of every business that we talk to. Later on next year, we've actually talking to one of our competitors that kind of got surprised with what we're doing. And uh, you, we may be able to add another 15,000 through them that have already got the relationship with uh, local merchants throughout the United States. Thank you, Andrew. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay, next up is Otterplan. Thanks, Howie. I'm Lisa Ganderson, co-founder and CEO of Otterplan. I'm here today with Rachel Classy, my co-founder and COO. And Rachel and I met at Duke in Fuqua getting our MBAs in 2012. Um, my background's in venture capital and Rachel's is in product marketing and development. And so about a year ago, Rachel and I both found ourselves engaged, a really exciting time in our life and planning our weddings. And we quickly realized that all of that excitement actually meant a ton of stress. Wedding planning is not very easy. And for us, the biggest problem was communication management. Thousands of emails we were sending and receiving to all of our different vendors that each had their own individual responsibilities, as well as wedding planners and coordinators at the venue. And the emails were just a total overload. So we actually reached out to professional wedding planners because we figured they probably already had a solution figured out. We talked to 200 wedding planners, not a single one had a better solution than email. And they actually had the problem way worse because it was on a recurring basis for their business. They do about 25 to 30 events per year. Each of those events have 15 to 20 individual vendors they have to manage. It adds up to about six hours a day behind a desktop on email when these are the people that should not be behind a desktop. They should be out building their small businesses, working with clients, and getting to know the vendors in their community. And this is why we made Otterplan. We decided to build Otterplan as a communication management platform for professional wedding vendors and planners to better communicate with each other as well as their clients, to streamline and organize everything that they do in a more professional, productive manner. Rachel and I knew we'd be the best people to do this because our backgrounds in the corporate world, we learned a lot of best practices around productivity that were, we, were, we were really eager to bring into the wedding space. So Otterplan works as a mobile and desktop app, so it's accessible anywhere. A user would log in, enter their events, and within each of those events, they create topic-based channels, which are effectively group chats that they invite relevant vendors to communicate with. And then they can also create private chats as well, one-on-ones with their clients or with specific vendors. The planner controls what everyone sees, so nobody's exposed to information that they might not, they should not be able to see. After an event's completed, we automatically archive every single communication. We were really surprised to learn when we talked to professionals that lawsuits over breach contracts in the wedding space are surprisingly common. So archiving conversations actually really protects professional vendors and planners from those contract issues or unhappy clients. We also help them manage all their professional contacts for a more seamless experience as they add other people to their events. And the wedding space is a really big market opportunity. It's a $58 billion market in the US alone. That's comprised of 2.2 million weddings per year serviced by nearly 1 million professional wedding vendors. It's a large space with a lot of companies. And so I just wanna break it down for you in terms of the landscape to explain where we fit. There's three types of companies that really exist in the wedding space. Vendor marketplaces, consumer applications, and business services for wedding professionals. We fall in that third bucket. Briefly on the first two, vendor marketplaces are companies like The Knot and Wedding Wire, the big ones you've probably already heard of, whether you've planned a wedding or not. Think of them as yellow pages for wedding vendors. You go there to find who to hire, but after that, you're on your own. So that's where Otterplan picks up the next 12 months of actually having to collaborate every single day with these people. 
consumer apps is the most crowded space in the wedding industry. There have been a lot of venture-backed startups that have popped up in the last two years. They all fall into this category. They solve a really specific problem for a bride or groom along the timeline of planning. Say you want to register at a non-traditional store or you want to consolidate photos your guests take. Those are these consumer apps and they don't really have much to do with what we offer. Business services for professionals is where we sit. It's a B2B uh, area of the market that's actually fairly untapped to date. We have a few competitors in the space, namely HoneyBook, Planning Pod, and Aisle Planner. They each create templates like budget templates and timeline templates to help planners, but they don't address collaboration, which is actually the number one pain point. We have a revenue subscription model on a monthly basis for our planners who then invite all of their vendors, so we create a network effect in that way. We acquire them primarily through network partnerships as well as digital marketing. In the network partnerships, we're currently working with Wedding Network and the Wedding Planner Institute of Canada to actually work to incorporate Otterplan as part of their curriculum as they train and certify new professional wedding planners that come on the market. And we're currently in beta right now with 140 wedding planners across the country who are key industry influencers in helping us decide what features to add and take away to the product before a release in February. So we have some bigger vision for a hotter plan that I'd love to chat with you more about after, um, but we'd love to take any questions you guys have for now. Thank you. Let's give everyone a round of applause. As more and more people are shifting away from having wedding planners to day of planners, is the wedding planner the wedge that you always want to go to, or do you imagine this a place where the bride or groom or both are sort of your touch point first to getting vendors onto the service? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, a lot of brides, especially now DIY weddings, are a really big deal. They want to have more of a stronghold in actually being part of the wedding planning process. Especially as people start to get married older, they're actually paying for their own weddings. They want to plan it themselves versus how it used to be. Wedding planners tended to be the majority of weddings. Now it's split about 50-50, those that hire a planner versus those that don't. We still think the planner is the way to go. They're always going to be the hub of information in terms of the first customer we want to go after. A lot of the day of coordinators, they actually aren't just there the day of or the month of. They're still working with vendors six months in advance and would still need to use a product like this. Thank you, Lisa. Let's give everyone a round of applause. Thank you. Next up is Pippa. Hey, everybody. I'm very excited to tell you a bit about Pippa. Uh, we're bringing podcasts into the present. Like AdWords for audio, Pippa is a podcast advertising marketplace. What does that mean and why are we so excited about podcasts? Well, it's partly because they're very popular right now. You know, 45 million people in the USA listened to a podcast in the last week. And basically, the more exciting thing for me is that they're very loyal listeners. If you listened to a podcast in the last week, likelihood is that you listened to six episodes. Moreover, they're profitable. They command the highest advertising rates around throughout the advertising media. Uh, this is more, say, than the Super Bowl, and it's more than the Academy Awards as well. Basically, it's because podcast ads work. They work really, really, really well. Large and small advertisers report significant upside to the campaigns that they run on podcasts. But there's a problem, and the problem is outdated and unfriendly technology. Let me tell you a scenario which will make this a little clearer. Imagine you go home today and you decide to put on some Seinfeld, watch an episode. Well, imagine you had to watch the ads from 1991 also. It would be kind of crazy, but that's really how podcast ads are basically done right now. They're baked into the show. So if you're listening to the episode in Seattle in 2010 or in Miami in 2020, you're going to hear the same ad. This is bad for content creators, for advertisers, and importantly, it's holding the podcast market back. But Pip is here to fix this. We're here to fix this through hosting, analytics, and advertising for the best podcasts and the smartest advertisers. I want to tell you how we're making podcasts valuable. We're doing this for content creators and for advertisers alike. For content creators, we're helping them to monetize their archives. The way it is right now, they're only monetizing the first two most recent months of the show. But really, those shows are being listened to all the way through the back catalog, but are earning no revenue. Pippa's technology allows them to liberate the revenue, which is currently locked in those episodes. 
we allow them also to sell dynamic ads. What does this mean? Well, it means that they don't have to sell their ads only once. They can sell their ads many times over across multiple geographies, earning more revenue for them and for Pippa. For advertisers, we're finally giving them the tools that they want and expect from every other digital media. Things like geo-targeting, so that they can reach the right listeners, and analytics, so that they can measure the impact of their campaigns. The marketplace is super simple. It's a podcaster who uploads his show to our platform, where it appears as inventory. Thereafter, it gets purchased from a store by the advertiser, and that ends up as a 25% take for Pippa. We're unlocking a lot of different parts of this market because of these dynamic ads. Now you can have Christmas sales, which obviously wouldn't make sense if you've only had the ad locked in at one time. There's no such thing as a Christmas sale in June. We're also bringing brand new advertisers into the market, like local businesses or businesses which operate only in certain geographic areas, companies like Handy or Southwest Airlines we've been talking to. We're also able to monetize this dormant back catalog, this dormant inventory, things like Ted's 2,500 episode archive, which is currently unmonetized altogether. We think that this could quadruple the marketplace in two years. There are many different streams that we have to make money on this. One is ad, the ad marketplace, the other is hosting, the other is analytics, and finally production services as well. And we have an outstanding team. Our Duke representative here tonight is one Eric Rabin, my co-founder. I used to work at TED and uh, Clinton Global Initiative, and our CTO, Erwan, was uh, uh, one of the chief developers at iHeartRadio with deep experience in the audio technology space. We are getting 250,000 monthly impressions with our live hosting and analytics platform, and we have developed the technology for our ad marketplace already. We're doing very exciting things at the front of this audio revolution, and would be delighted to talk with you about that after this. Thank you. Can you describe uh, in a little bit more detail what the uh, technology itself does? You sort of, uh, in particular, I guess I'm wondering about, is there a live read by the host, and then you're only backfilling for, you know, older episodes? How does that work? Yeah, sure. Cool question. So one of the strengths of our technology is that we're able to accommodate not just the live read, but also ads which are dropped in. So, I mean, part of what you're getting at, I think, is like a lot of successful podcast ads are ones which are read kind of casually by the host and in a riffy kind of way. But then there are also these ones like the MailChimp ad, which is, you know, the same one over and over again. And people have a certain fondness and affinity for that like highly stylized brand ad. Basically, we have the tech to just drop in and insert that wherever it should appear, kind of like real ads. Um, <laughs> like we're, we're really trying to bring the tech up to speed with the, the kind of technology that underpins other digital media and that the advertisers expect from that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Next up is RateFrame. Thanks, Howie. I'm Seth Squadron, I'm the CEO of RateFrame, uh, and I'm gonna give you a very quick overview of what we do at RateFrame. So first of all, let me say we're a winning team. Uh, we took top honors in the NYU Entrepreneurs Challenge, 200,000 Entrepreneurs Challenge in the spring. That's a seven month competition where we're competing against 96 other teams. We have a diverse group. Um, we have expertise to execute on our vision. Um, let me just ask everybody in this room to raise your hand if you've watched an online video in the last week. I just want to get a sense of pretty much 120% of the room. Not sure that's mathematically possible, but um, that makes sense because there's been this amazing proliferation of video online in the last several years as content owners and website publishers have looked to engage their audience. But this has actually created a problem for the average user. It's overwhelming to have all this video. Um, you don't know where to put your time and attention. And as we know, in the internet economy, attention equals monetization. So we have this situation where there's all this great content out there, but viewers don't know what is really valuable, what's really relevant for them. And RateFrame offers a solution to this problem. Rate for, we boost mon video monetization for content owners and website publishers, and we do this through a simple and powerful system that allows people to highlight, 
play back and share the best parts of online video. Let me show you exactly how it works. So this is the rate frame interface under a video. We have a piece that we've highlighted. This user has highlighted about two minutes of the nine minute video and it jumps seamlessly between the sections that have been highlighted. We can share it out, we can embed it in a blog, we can share it on social media, um, we can share it with email, and it plays natively within a Twitter stream, and you can visually see exactly what's good about this video, and it's gonna jump between just those sections. We can integrate with any website that hosts video. It's very easy, this is an example on youtube.com using our proprietary plugin, and we gather all the data and interaction through RateFrame to deliver some really unique analytics. So this is what we call a crowd rating, which is a computed average of all the people who've watched this particular video. There are a multitude of use cases. RateFrame has been called the cliff notes of educational videos. Um, it's been described by marketers as a dial test that actually scales. Um, and people use it to make personalized previews for everything from video production to entertainment. For the website publisher, we're really delivering a better return on investment, and that's where we're making our money. We're doing that through increased engagement, increased shares, and reliable viewer metrics. So in terms of increased engagement, we found that when people have RateFrame installed and are using the RateFrame system, they're watching about four times the length of the video that you're watching if you just watch a video without RateFrame. In terms of increased sharing, we're sending out shares uh, that are relevant and specific. We're not send, sending out a 20 minute video and saying, hey, find the best parts. We're sending out the 35 seconds that are relevant to that particular audience. So it's a much more efficient way. You never have people say, oh, it's too long, I didn't watch. And for video asset managers, they love this system because there's a cost to producing every single video and we're actually giving a multiple of return with a rate frame because every time a rate frame is created, it's going out in a specific, configuration to different audiences, and those audiences are getting value out of it. We deliver reliable viewer metrics. We're able to really pinpoint what people are watching. This is not, oh, there was a video that auto-played on the website. This is exactly what people are watching by demographic group. So imagine watching this video through the eyes of each segment of your target audience. There's no other platform that allows for this kind of um, insight. 20 more seconds. Uh, this is a quick example of an integration we've done. We integrate with one line of code um, and we can skin the rate frame interface to make it match whatever the website is. Uh, that's a quick overview of rate frame. Uh, if you know of websites that would benefit from the rate frame platform, please talk to me. If you just wanna try it out on our website and create your own highlighted online videos, shoot me an email at seth at rateframe.com. I'm happy to send you an invitation check code check us out on Twitter, and I'm happy to answer any, answer any questions. Thanks so much. Thanks, Seth. Um, so are you guys doing anything to drive further engagement back to the original publishing site? Yeah, so I may not have been totally clear, but we never touch the underlying video asset. So if it's a YouTube video, it's still gonna be a YouTube video. We're creating a level of metadata on top of that video. So when you're sharing it out on Twitter, you're actually sharing the original content. That content is being embedded in Twitter or wherever else that you're sharing it. And uh, when you're watching that rate frame video, you can actually go back to the original content. So, so the, the idea is that we're driving people back to the original site with the sharing um, functionality that we have. Great. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. Next up is Vamoose. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jeffy Menda, and today I will tell you a little bit about Vamoose. This whole project really started because I'm incredibly annoyed by the buzzer coasters at Shake Shack. I mean, why on earth do we need an extra physical equipment for something that our phones can easily do? This itch in my brain planted the first seeds of the idea that eventually became Vamoose. See, I slowly started realizing that it wasn't only the buzzer coasters that were the problem. It's the whole order pay pickup system that exists in so many supposedly modern locations. In this day and age, nobody wants to wait in line for somebody else to do what they can do on their own. 
This is why we see so many self-checkout systems appear at grocery stores and self-check-in systems appear at airports. Now, Vamoose is a brand new order and checkout technology that is bringing this um, trend to fast casual restaurants and coffee shops. With Vamoose, customers are now gonna be able to place their orders and pay for them directly on their smartphones. For users, this means skip the line, earn rewards, earn discounts, and avoid human errors. For clients, it's even better. They can actually have access to intelligent data. Um, they can reduce their labor costs significantly. And according to some Deloitte studies, they can actually increase customer spending by up to 26%. Now, of course, before talking about any of these benefits, we need to talk about users. Going over the numbers briefly, there are actually 152 million adults in the United States who own a smartphone and go to a fast casual restaurant at least once a week. Moreover, there are actually 35 million adults who have already downloaded a restaurant app on their phones, making them ideal initial users. Now, we're pretty confident about user acquisition because we know that we hold some key advantages uh, against our competitors that will make the difference. Aside from the traditional unexpected functionalities that are data usage, rewards, and discounts, Vamoose is proud to be able to offer um, three key functionalities that we call the SIF. Now, S here is for the pricing mechanism, mechanism that we have that is entirely based on client savings. I is um, for our commitment to POS integrations. And F is for the brand new food surge attribute that allows users to actually check out with only two clicks. Looking at our competitors, uh, within our primary competition, there's actually no one who can offer um, these three, out of these three key functionalities, uh, the, the, there's no one that can offer two of them simultaneously. Well, Vamos is not some small isolated project. It's the first step of a much larger vision. Within a few years, we plan on um, expanding our markets and allowing users to actually scan their items and, and uh, pay for them directly on their phones. A few years after that, we plan on becoming a full-fledged mobile POS system. Now, the team behind this idea is simply a few originals who understand this market well and are brave enough to bring the change to it. Supporting us, we have a strong team of advisors, both on the business and technical side, that help us out at every step of the way. Now, there's an opportunity here to join Vamoose at an early stage. We're seeking 450,000 um, of seed investments in order to carry out development, sales, and marketing operations. I'd like to finish this presentation by saying that the time for Vamoose is now. So join us and let's make waiting in lines obsolete. Thank you. Um, what's the business model? Well, in terms of revenue generation, we're basically counting on um, client savings, the, specifically the savings that are generated by using Vamoose. And quite simplistically, what happens is Vamoose effectively becomes a cheaper version of a cashier. So they're essentially paying what, they're, what they make on labor savings, or a, a percentage out of that, if that makes sense. Thank you, Jeffy. We can talk about that as well. <laughs> Okay, last but not least is Broadway Plus. Hi, my name is Nathaniel Hill, uh, Trinity class of 12, and I've been working on, on Broadway shows on the business management side since graduation. Since I was a kid, I have always loved Broadway, but what I always wanted to do when I was a kid was get behind that door and see what was happening backstage. The problem is you can't buy backstage access for Broadway. There's no product, there's no way to go meet the stars of the show, go see the wig rack, go see the props, and find out how theater really works. What that means is that shows are not capitalizing on an opportunity they have to generate revenue. What I'm doing with Broadway Plus is helping shows take their very best seats and convert them into VIP packages for Broadway shows. That means when you buy that seat, you're spending twice as much, but you're also getting a chance to go backstage, meet the cast, drinks in the theater, gift bag, charity, whatever the show decides is the most appropriate components to add to their package. This is a product that is huge in both the music and sports industries. Billion dollars just within sports when you go to the Yankee game and you get the box seats. Beyonce can sell her VIP packages for $12,000. Hamilton's gonna be a little less than that. <laughs> 
but um, there's a lot of demand for the right product um, for this kind of package. The business model is this. Uh, a show, if you see on the existing premium revenue level, they might have made 275 on their very best seats. What I'm going to help them do is generate an extra 175 and then I am owed a $250 fee. Out of that, uh, I have hard costs, paying the actor to give the backstage tour, drinks, all of that, costs me something to promote it, but it's a pretty decent profit margin on something like this. Uh, if you take that, it's, let's say I can do six, six tickets a show. With Hamilton, which is a partnership that I have right now, it's gonna be 13. Uh, but let's say on average it's six, I am looking at hopefully getting about 10 partner shows by the end of 2017, eight shows a week, $75, and it's a decent business if you can promote them and actually sell that many. Uh, this really is a product that doesn't exist at all. Uh, like I said, huge in sports and music, not at all on Broadway. Uh, of course, we have brokers, we have concierges. A couple shows offer things that are somewhat similar, but only once a week or something like that. What I offer to the shows is a service that fulfills them, makes it easy, not a, pin, not a pain in the side of anyone in management. And then I also promote them as a whole to the world at large and to anyone who might be interested in the product. Uh, Broadway is doing great. It's been an amazing 10 years. Uh, we've almost doubled our revenue as an industry in the last 10 years. Uh, we're up to 70% tourists, which is good at both good and bad, but tourists tend to want to spend a lot of money when they're in New York. Um, 13 million theater goers a year. You also have 400,000 millionaires living in New York City. So even if we only get one or 2% of those, of those numbers, that's enough to, to support a business like this. Uh, what I'm looking for today is basically strategic partnerships to help move this product. Uh, where should I advertise this? How do I get this to those people who might be interested in it, which I realize is a rather niche market. <laughs> um, and also, I'm, I'm just about to launch. I have a website built. I have partnerships with Hamilton, Wicked, Kinky Boots, and Beautiful, uh, and I've pitched another five or six shows that, are, that I think will pull through. Um, and so I'm just looking to build the company and become the go-to person for this kind of service. Uh, and the beauty is that it can grow into a lot of different things. Las Vegas is a big market. London is a big market. Touring is bigger than all of those combined. Um, and there's a lot of different things that you can do in the travel and luxury experiences space uh, once you've created a company with, with such a niche focus. That's me. What questions can I answer? Okay. Um, I like the idea. I, I, I'm curious, uh, as, as you grow this, how, how do you protect yourself from being... Um, you know, other people inventing yeah. the space? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, and there's not a magic answer. Basically, the strategy is become the go-to person now uh, and just sort of be the one who can, who can sell these. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky that I've had developed a lot of relationships with a lot of the strongest shows, and you just sort of, you say, look, if Hamilton, Wicked, Mormon, if all these shows are with me, then Hopefully they'll come to me as well. Can you get that to commit to you being exclusive? Yeah, yeah. I, I require Amanda asks if I have an exclusive contract, and my contract is very explicitly that they can only work with me to sell this kind of product. Very good. Thank you. Nice Thank you. Okay. So here's what happens next. Uh, so the judges, I'm going to ask you to go with Ryan and Bill and Kelly and Katie to a room that way to uh, deliberate for about 10 minutes, maybe a slightly more than that. And you, the audience, you get to participate right now and select your favorite. So we'll let the judges go first. And then we're gonna have an open mic session where anybody in the audience can say hello. If you're looking for a job, now's a great time to stand up and say that. If you have a company and you're hiring, now's a great time to say that as well. Okay, so. Um, here's what's going to happen. We're going to do audience choice voting. Take out your cell phones. There's going to be a code for you to type in for the favorite team that you want to vote for tonight. I'm going to say this. Uh, the, the only people that should vote tonight are the people here in the audience. So don't put this out on Twitter. Don't put it out on Facebook. Don't text message 100 friends or group me and message anybody. 
this vote is only for people here in the audience. If we get janky numbers, I'm going to do a hand count to see who, uh, who actually voted for the team. OK. So here's what you're going to do. Text, send a text message to the number 22333, OK? And the code that corresponds to the team you want to vote for is this 499 code, OK? Does that make sense to everyone? You have a question? What did they get? <laughs> Just the satisfaction of winning. Yes. Well, I guess it says the best pitch, so we'll say best pitch, but use your own judgment. Which team do you think should win? The winning team is Debitize. 21% Pippa, second place. Debitize, Jeff, congratulations. First place there. That's my email. OK. So here's what happens next. Uh, I'll show you. I don't, want to, I don't want to embarrass anyone that didn't get many votes. So we don't. OK. Here's what's happening next, actually. So Q&A with the teams. All teams, if you don't mind coming on stage, Lisa, Taylor, everybody, come on on stage. And Q&A with anybody in the audience. Anybody in the audience gets to ask any question that they want of any team member. Becky, yes. Hello, Sarah. OK, so uh, audience members, please feel free to shout out any questions that you have to, well, you don't have to shout them out right away. But raise your hand if you have a question for any team member. What questions do you have? What do you want to know? Brandon, you know what? I'll just run out here. Well, uh, Becky at LRA. Um, Somewhat of a personal interest and also a business question is maybe once you have uh, more capacity to scale and, and produce more, would you consider um, creating like white labeled? Uh, it, it seems like a very like like the concept of like this kind of like energy ball or like snack thing. Uh, people might have their own branding spins on it with the same basic ingredients like cacao and yeah. coconut and dates and nuts, things like that. I feel like there's like a few major combinations and different ways you could brand it personally interested and also as a business yeah when when if possible have you thought about that yeah i think white labeling is definitely an option i've talked with a few people about it um i think based on these ingredients um it is a higher price point than just you know some random energy bite so um that can come into play depending on what company we'd be working with but definitely open to it and would that be like now or would you need to have more production capacity and and things like that in place first? Um, well, we could talk about it, because okay. potentially now. Thanks. <laughs> when you said you were going to ask a personal question, I thought you were going to propose or something. <laughs> OK, next question. Yes, right here. <laughs> that was good. Though. First of all, I, I mean, I was talking with Janet through the show. I, we thought a lot of the presentations were extremely strong. So I, I mean, congratulations to all of you. I think you have very strong business models. And uh, makes me proud as a Duke grad. Uh, I had a question for rate frame, which I thought was a really cool idea. Do, do you, do I as a consumer have to install software? And when I share something, does someone else also, like whoever's receiving the link, do they also need software installed? Yeah, so there, there actually is no software. So you can go to rateframe.com now, sign up, go onto our website. You rate something on the site when you share it out. It's shared directly into a Twitter feed or a social network or via an email. You, the person that you're sharing it with, whether watch it in that social feed or come back to our website um, to watch it. So there's never any, any software to install. The one um, thing that we do do is that we have a plugin available uh, so that you can use RateFrame directly on YouTube. So it's a Chrome or Firefox plugin. If you install that plugin, then you can just be on YouTube.com and get all the benefits of RateFrame right on the. Quick follow up question. Yeah. So I would imagine some like YouTube, which monetizes several parts of their videos, feel differently about skipping over certain sections. So how does that work? Well, so, I mean, as I mentioned before, we never touch the underlying assets. We're never changing the underlying video. We're just letting people highlight the parts of video that they really like. And, you know, I mean, this happens already. You know, we kind of like to say, 
millions of people are scrubbing through videos every day trying to find the good parts. We're automating that process. You often see in comments on YouTube or in other places, people send out and say, hey, check out two minutes and 20 seconds to two minutes and 30 seconds. But it's super inefficient. It's not a very good way of doing it. So with rate frame, we allow people to go directly to what's really valuable. Also for rate frame, uh, just thinking through the highlighting feature, how are you different than something like a Framio? I think that's used more like by professional video editors. Um, and how do you see that kind of your place in the marketplace versus them? Yeah, so, so one of our um, core values is that the online video space is awesome, it's huge, it's open. And we really believe that everybody should have the ability to highlight the parts that are good. I mean, you can do it with eBooks, you can do it with offline books, you take a highlighter and you highlight the parts that are important to you. Um, and we thought it was really important that people be able to do that with rate frames. So, um, you know, we are a system that will never charge from the consumer side to be able to go in and do a rate frame. And right now we're really focused on integrating uh, with businesses that have libraries of video and that want to give their consumers that value. Um, and so, you know, when you think about uh, you know, kind of how we're approaching the market, we're approaching the market really to influence the end user, and it's not a production environment or something else like that. My question is for Pippa. Um, so I think part of why podcast advertising is so effective is because it's so highly curated. So how are you going to allow content providers to make sure that their ad experience remains true to the content? Yeah, it, it, that's a, like a really savvy question because you're totally right. Like a lot of what has made like the podcast ads so successful is that they are very well paired to the people who are delivering the message and to, to the audience. Basically, we're offering a, a really customizable solution for the advertisers. So as an advertiser logs on to Pippa's platform, what they get to do is they can be as like indiscriminate as they want. Like, hey, I want to get 100,000 listens. They could just do that. And I don't care where they come from. I just want 100,000 people to hear this. Or they could be much more carefully crafted. They could say, no, I, I know the listeners of the moth and I want I want the next episode because I know that one's going to be about the election. I want specifically to talk to those people and specifically on that program and they can purchase something there and interact directly with the, with the creators to craft something which, which works exactly right for that. But the good thing about it is that it won't be locked in forever. So like two weeks later, if they want, they can sell that ad spot again. So for Viva, um, what data do you have that people go, and go back in significant numbers to past podcasts? We get the data directly from the, the podcasters themselves because uh, right now, you know, the, the only way we have to find that is directly from the podcasters. But it's something that we've seen a lot more of lately with increasing like serialized shows. So, for example, if you haven't yet listened to Serial and you might be the only one in the room, you're gonna to have to start at the beginning, right? Like you're gonna to have to start at episode one and there are more and more shows just like that. Certainly for like current news and things like that, you're not gonna to listen to previous episodes, but there are tons where we, we hear from people, yeah, uh, like they might get 10,000 listens on the, on the day that they release the show, but a good 30% of those come from back episodes. I know at least for myself, when I've listened to a, uh, like a, a podcast, I'll, if it's a new one I've liked, I might be like, oh, this is great. I'm going to start all over at the beginning or at least listen to another episode, which will be outside of the currently monetized frame. Wonderful. A couple more questions. Don't be shy. No? All right, let's give everyone a round of applause. Thank you, guys. You can have a seat. Okay, uh, so we're just waiting for the judges to come back. Uh, so now's the open mic time which can be fantastic, thank you. Uh, and we've actually had people find jobs uh, through this. So anybody can come up to say pretty much anything. I think the best topics are 
I have a company I'm looking to hire or I just graduated, I'm looking to find a job or, you know, I just left a company, I'm looking to find a job. So anybody that wants to come up, hello, how are you? Come on stage. And if you want to come up, please uh, start to form a line maybe over this way. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kendall Bailey, founder and CEO of Kidzy, K-I-D-Z-Y. We are modernizing online childcare education for millennial parents. So if you think about how parents get their education today, it's like those really thick, outdated books that are really scary. Um, and those will be books, you know, we think they're going to be doorstoppers in five years' time. Or they go to like in-person hospital classes that are still $400 and eight hours on a Saturday. Very inconvenient, definitely not millennial friendly um, and not referenceable. So we're moving all of this to an online learning platform uh, through curated three-minute videos. Uh, we've got a beta up. We are looking to hire, um, particularly on the tech and go-to-market side, if kind of healthcare marketing side, and also fundraising. So if you know of any kind of angel investors in that space that might be interested in this type of investment for a female-founded team uh, or hiring, would love to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's fantastic. Let's give a round of applause. Uh, hey, folks, if you're having a conversation, no problem. I think it's great. If you don't mind just moving back to the back of the room, that'd be great. Simon, hey, if you don't mind just moving to the back. It's great to have a conversation. Just move to the back of the room. Thank you. Sorry, y'all. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Michael Haley, class of 2008. I am with a company called Alpha Point. We've raised about $2 million in seed funding. We're a fintech startup focusing on blockchain slash distributed ledger technology, and we're looking to make a junior hire for someone on the business operations marketing side. So if that's you, if that's someone you know, ideally in or adjacent to the Duke community, please reach out. Um, I actually just ran out of business cards, but I'm Michael at Alpha Point and findable through Howie and everyone else. So thank you. Michael at Alpha Point. Thank you. Great, Michael. All right, Brandon. I'm uh, Brandon Sassuni. Duke grad of 2015, and I'm working on a online marketplace for uh, apartment rentals, and it's going to be um, basically it's going to use uh, machine learning and community feedback to make predictive and suggestive matches for people who are looking for apartments, rather than just using uh, filtration and then letting people fend for themselves to to find the best match. Um, I have designed out the prototype and have been talking to different brokerages and management companies who would be interested in this on the back end side to better manage their listings and match to the proper tenant as well because that could uh, basically decrease the time that something's on the market and increase how much that they're able to get for that apartment. Right now I'm looking for technical co-founders to help build out the um, initial backend that can match people. And I've already identified the APIs and I have a broker's license in New York. So as part of the real estate board here, I would have access to the listing, like most of the listings that are shared within the uh, community. So if you're interested in the idea of um, real estate tech and specifically within this brokerage platform, uh, and want to help out either technical or some other way, uh, reach out. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Brandon. I can personally vouch for Brandon. He actually used to work for me. Amazing guy. So uh, if you're interested in real estate tech, definitely reach out to Brandon. He's awesome. Hey, I'm Ben Freeberg. I work with Steve Brotman, who is on the panel at Alpha Venture Partners, who I met through Howie. I called him up, told him what I was looking to do, and he sent me an email that day introducing me to Steve. And within a week, I was at a new job. So ah. it was awesome. Uh, so we are a small team. It's two partners and myself. And we're looking to hire another analyst um, who hopefully one to two years of experience and anyone that wants to get into tech venture. So do you know of anyone? And we also look at Series B and later startups in addition to Seed and Series A for Pritz Group Venture Capital. So any startup ideas as well. Thanks. Very few opportunities in venture capital. Go hunt down Ben if you can. Buy him a drink <laughs> or food. All right. Hello. Hey, uh, I'm Joe Lux, um, uh, Trinity 2010. Um, I'm the head of enterprise sales at a company called Beeswax. Uh, our whole kind of mantra is if you're going to start a hedge fund, you wouldn't do it on E-Trade. Uh, sophisticated marketer shouldn't be, you know, 
running their entire marketing budgets on very simplistic legacy platforms. Um, so we raised a uh, Series A of 11 million a couple months ago, uh, and we're hiring, uh, really need to hire. <laughs> so uh, C++ and Java engineers, uh, uh, full stack developers, um, technical account managers, enterprise sales folks, uh, we're hiring aggressively. So if you're in market, uh, certainly feel free to come find me. Thanks. Great, beeswax, and how much did you raise? Uh, 11, million. 11 million, fantastic. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're just gonna take a little break here. People are already enjoying, so everyone just stand up and uh, enjoy for a little bit, and I'll call you back, okay? All right, everyone, Oops. hello. All right, come on up here. We're gonna have the uh, results from our judges. Please join us here. So judges, if you don't mind coming up on stage, whoever's gonna announce the feedback here. Teams, if you don't mind, CEOs, if you don't mind coming up over here, the CEOs of the teams, please come up on stage on this side. Yeah, so great. So the first team to get feedback, I think is gonna be, oh good. The first team is going to be Andrew. Andrew with, for Debitize. Okay, got it. Debitize, Debitize, Debitize. Jeff from Debitize, come on up here. That way Andrew can talk to you and not talk into space. Hi, hey Jeff. Uh, so uh, thanks for pitching. First of all, I really enjoyed uh, hearing about Debitize and, uh, and what you had to say. I'd say, uh, you know, in discussing it, our feedback was, uh, number one, we were impressed by the pitch. Seemed like it was, uh, you know, well thought through, well put together. Uh, and, and so we liked the concept overall. I'd say the, uh, the biggest piece uh, of sort of, uh, the biggest question we had was around the consumer value proposition. Um, you know, is, um, and folks were a little bit confused about that as well, basically, is we understood it, you know, uh, taking money out of your account, holding it you know, essentially in escrow and then paying it, uh, you know, both to help make sure you don't run out of money and also for FICO score purposes. Is that, uh, you know, enough of a, uh, a value prop to really, uh, you know, drive users you know, to sign up for it? We weren't totally sold on that. So that's sort of, I think, you know, demonstrating more traction in that area um, is the, the biggest piece that we would like to see. Awesome. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. This is just the feedback portion. So no announcements are being made about who's when. Uh, next up is Becky Holmes with Ello Raw and Adam. Come on up, both of you. Um, so yeah, great pitch overall. Um, thought it was like a really concise story. I think one question mark we had was sort of just understanding the um, competitive landscape a little better and sort of um, obviously the sort of health and wellness space is growing really quickly, but how do you differentiate? Yeah. Um, and but how do you build a compelling sort of brand story around that? Um, all the good stuff was sort of story around the customer um, acquisition so far, influencer marketing, um, really impressed with the traction in store and sort of both wholesale as well as direct to consumer. Um, and then frankly, just like the amount of progress on fairly small amount of capital raised so far. So I think overall, really good job. Great, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Becky, nice job. Next up is Taylor from Focusmate and feedback from Steve, I believe. Or, yes, for Taylor. All right, Taylor, so good job. Um, interesting product. Um, you know, there was a, there. I would say that um, uh, in in the venture business, it's go big or go home. And probably of all the all the companies that presented, probably we we all kind of agreed that your idea and opportunity, if it works, is a big idea, right? Because there's not anyone really in the sector. Productivity is a huge concern, um, and uh, some of your um, points about uh, co-working um, really uh, resonated to, to a degree. Not, not so much for me personally. I prefer to have like a quiet space, like no one talking to me. <laughs> Classic Gen X uh, attitude, I guess. Um, where, however, my, uh, my millennial associate, Ben, um, prefers to have people around him, lots of activity, yeah, let's go to WeWork. and have lots of buzz and things going on and, and a social work environment. So I think there's a bit of a generational divide to a degree around, around your product. But you know, if you think about working out or you think about 
doing different things, people want to have that sort of social thing. So if it works, it's going to be big. It's kind of too early to say yay or nay relative to some of the other companies, but we just wanted to say, hey, good job. If it works, you know, you probably have one of the bigger, bigger opportunities here. Um, but you do, there was a little bit of an issue kind of communicating um, some of how big this could be in your, in your, in your presentation in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I think um, like if you think about WeWork, that's a big, co-working is a big space, your virtual co-working, right? That's a, that's a big, that's a big type of thing and uh, is increasingly going to be there. So good luck. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Amanda and Andrew. Andrew. Hi. So um, as someone who runs a local business, we are looking for uh, you know, products and services just like yours. So I think the local really spoke to me personally. Uh, and rewarding loyalty is also something that I think is the right way a business should operate versus rewarding first-time behavior, which is what most businesses tend to do. So I like that aspect of what you're offering. Um, the discount thing, as we discussed earlier, isn't my personal thing. And some companies are starting to shy away from that a little. Um, so you'll have to, to work that out. Um, just with the presentation, though, I think four minutes was a little hard for you to convey exactly what it is, because there seems to be a lot of aspects to it, the gamification. So I think there was a little confusion with what it actually is just based on the four minutes. But, you know, as someone who's a potential customer, I think it, it's a service that we need. It can't just be about Yelp. Yelp feels a little outdated. So. Jonathan and Otterplan, Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming up and presenting. Um, it was really great to learn a little bit more about Otterplan. Um, so I think, you know, we all agreed you've kind of hit on a, on a problem. You know, I mean, personally, it's been a couple of years since I went through it, but I remember a lot of email and a lot of hecticness around just, you know, getting through the wedding process. Um, so it's definitely um, a big problem that I think resonates with a lot of people. Um, I think the specific solution that you guys are targeting around kind of messaging and, and reducing the email inbox clutter makes a ton of sense, um, but um, is probably best as part of a broader solution set. Um, you know, something that can be accomplished through, you know, text messages or, or you know, Slack maybe in the future or other channels. Um, but it is, it is an important component of a broader um, you know, productivity suite. And maybe it's a productivity suite for, um, for the um, uh, wedding planners uh, or other types of vendors, uh, or maybe it's more of a marketplace. And this is a way that you can connect people. And when you connect people, you know, you can um, also create new connections. And that's a really interesting revenue opportunity. Um, so, you know, if, if you continue to build it out, I think there could be a lot of interesting stuff there. Kippa and Darian. Hey Eric, uh, a bit of a confession to make. Um, we talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago, so I thought I was going to have all this great insight, but then it turns out you talked to a couple of the other judges as well. So I felt a lot less special. <laughs> Be that as it may. Um, so feedback, I thought you had a really great presentation. You have a great rapport with the crowd. Like it was easy to understand and convey. And this is an opportunity or a, a market that really needs to be disrupted. It's just primed for that. Um, some of the constructive feedback to give you is um, had a little trouble figuring out what your differentiation was. There are a lot of other people doing some of the same things. Maybe you need a chart showing that you do all these things. Maybe picking out a couple of features that you do that nobody else does, something along those lines. Um, but overall, I thought you did a great job. Thanks so much. Sure. Uh, Mangesh, Mangesh, and Seth. Hey Seth, how's it going? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff on uh, online video. Uh, I'm, I can never keep up. I was really sort of like fascinated as a user to, to be able to see things. I also think on Facebook, there's so many videos that like, you know, you start, but you can't see where the highlights are and whatever. So like, and for someone who's hang hungry for analytics, like I, I really thought seeing that sort of broken up and is, is really kind of fascinating. And, and I am someone who would watch a preview and then watch the video based on it. Um, I, I think uh, there's 
a, a little bit of uh, confusion from the pitch of like who the main user was exactly, whether it was more the brand or, or the super fans who are sort of uh, proliferating this content and, and a bit of a question about how, um, you know, how, how it was going to be monetized exactly, but, um, but we like the, the idea of it, certainly. Jonathan, I think Jonathan, yep. Jonathan and Jeffy. Uh, so thanks for presenting Vamoose. Uh, it's interesting business. Um, I think, you know, uh, a lot of us were talking about the order ahead app through Starbucks and you know, how popular that is. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely something that's been proven in the marketplace. Um, it is a bit of a challenge to kind of get that going though, right? Obviously, if you're Starbucks, you have folks on both the consumer side and you've got a ton of stores ready. Um, so that's going to be probably your biggest challenge going forward is, is building up that two-sided marketplace and having enough liquidity in it that when I open the app for the first time, my favorite place is there. And if it's not there, then that's going to be a big problem. Now, you can promote through the stores and maybe you can go that way. Um, there might be a good option to kind of wrap it in with some partners in the point of sale space where you, know, you could be the, the kind of order ahead solution. Um, you'll really have to kind of carve out some differentiation for yourself in, in that way. Um, one, one point of feedback around, you know, how you guys are thinking about building out the product. It's, it's cool that you have a lot of features in there and I'm sure that attracts um, restaurateurs and, and other small businesses, but it can be really difficult to kind of hone that pitch and also to really, you know, keep your team focused as, as you're a small company and you're growing. So I'd really try to focus on the core value proposition, build that out, sell against that, and then you could build around it. Thanks. Okay, last piece of feedback is from Andrew to Broadway Plus. Hey, so thanks, for much, uh, thanks so much for presenting Broadway Plus. And I was a big uh, Broadway fan and theater goer myself. I was really excited to, uh, to see the pitch and see the service being offered. I think uh, you know, for me and for the other judges, it absolutely made sense as a, a business that should exist uh, and that uh, really, I'm not sure why it hasn't been done before. And I think uniformly, we were really impressed with uh, the pitch itself, your presentation of the pitch. Um, uh, and really, I think you, you sold all of us on uh, the idea that you're going to be able to create the service for the Broadway market. Um, I would say our one point of feedback was in discussing um, you know, it really depends what lens you want to view the business under. Is this a, you know, great small business or is this something that, you know, really should be venture backed and that you want to, uh, you know, really scale? So our, our concerns were entirely around, um, you know, can you expand this beyond Broadway or can you, you know, raise prices substantially more to the Beyonce level, you know, to make it a big business just within Broadway? Those were where we had questions, I think, within the Broadway market itself. Uh, you know, we were, we were totally sold on the business. Okay, great. So um, I guess I'm just going to announce who who did what. So uh, honorable mention, honorable mention went to uh, Broadway Plus. Congratulations, Daniel. <laughs> Runner up, so second place went to Rate Frame. Rate Frame, congratulations. Uh, and if we could bring the judges up after I announce this one, and Kelly and Katie and. Ryan, Bill, for a photo here. Uh, the winner was uh, Ella Raw. Come on up here, folks. Come on up for a photo. Judges, if you don't mind coming up, Becky, come on up. We'll just take a quick photo here of the group up right in front here, right in front. Here we go. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the event. We'll see you at Live Bait, Live Bait on 20 something street. <laughs>